I sit alone and marvel at what I see inside. I am aware. I perceive an inner world of pulsing thoughts and wave-like feelings, my private sense of personal consciousness. But is personal consciousness anything special? How radical the diverging views. Scientists state that my consciousness is just my brain, itself the random results of accidental evolution. Theologians believe that my consciousness reflects a creator God who made it. Mystics hold that my consciousness is but a drop in the ocean of cosmic consciousness, which is the real reality. What's right? Is human consciousness special? I'm Robert Lawrence Kuhn, and Closer to Truth is my journey to find out. I start with materialism, that only the physical is real. No souls or spirits here. How would consciousness work as a mechanism? I go to MIT to ask the flint-minded pioneer of artificial intelligence, Marvin Minsky. Nothing mystical for Marvin. Marvin, can you say there's anything really special about human consciousness? Well, I think there's something very special about human thinking, which I like to call reflectiveness or, or self-consciousness, if you like. And that's the ability to remember what you've been doing. And by remember, that's an interesting concept itself, because there are many ways to remember things. You can remember something as an image or as a sequence of sounds or as a diagram. Or, mm -hmm. And then there are ways of remembering for which we have no words. But just as in a computer, we can represent data in maybe 20 different ways called data structures. We've evolved a large number of ways to represent our previous mental states or part of them. And I don't think any other animals have this ability to represent in many different ways what you've been doing recently and what were the results and so forth, so that you can then uh, not only think about what you've done in the world, but you can think about the course that your thinking proceeded along. And you can say, well, I've wasted a lot of time. I'm not doing very well on this problem. Maybe I should think back and try to think about this using method four, which is good for this kind of problem. And so this is, I think, what makes us unique, able to imagine uh, situations that haven't happened yet. And therefore, what we're doing is internalizing and simulating different uh, worlds and testing them out in our inside before we choose one and do it in the world. That's right. And in my book, I also use another level called self-conscious reflection. In self-conscious reflection, you're doing something even stranger, which is you're saying, are the actions I'm considering or I've recently done uh, do those agree with my ideals and values that I've learned? And uh, that's, we could use the word conscience as well as conscious. And I wonder if any animals have anything like that level. Theologians would like to come along and look at consciousness and say, okay, that's where we need our immortal soul. Because whatever you're defining that has a uniqueness to human beings and this kind of consciousness needs this something special. Well, you could have a place for an immortal soul, but what would you do with it? <laughs> Unless you tell me how it works, uh, I'm not interested. It's like saying that there's an elephant in the next room. Uh, well, I could go and look, and it wouldn't be there. Uh, if it's a soul, I could go and look, and you're telling me it's invisible and indetectable, so I'll stop listening to you. <laughs> what are the parts of the spirit, and how do they interact? What is the essence made of? and what is its structure? It's a perfectly human and natural thing if you don't have a good theory of psychology and if you can't imagine how a reflective layer in the brain could think about what you've been thinking before, then you say, well, there's a spirit there. It's, it's a way to keep from thinking about 
and wasting your time if you don't know enough. Marvin says that self-reflectiveness is unique to human beings, but it's produced by layers in the brain, certainly not by some silly spirit or soul. I did my doctorate in brain research, and I have felt the same at times. But at other times, I set to wonder, can human consciousness be something more? Can the massive mountain of human beliefs be ignored? Can the mystical be so easily dismissed? I go to the University of California, Irvine, to meet a psychiatrist who is an expert on Eastern mystical traditions, Dr. Roger Walsh. Roger is a neuroscientist and a devotee of meditative practices. I start to approach the question of consciousness from as many perspectives as possible. My assumption is that each discipline, from evolutionary theory to biology to neuroscience to cultural studies to spiritual studies, has something to contribute, something valuable to tell us. And not surprisingly, each discipline gives us a different answer. Actually, even the evolutionary theorists have different ideas. Some say it's just an accidental byproduct that it happened along the way, and here we are, and it was a nice, enjoyable accident. Well, let's enjoy the ride. Others say that it's essential for survival. This is part of our, our nature's survival machines. Consciousness is a very fancy, broke way DNA has of replicating <laughs> itself. Uh, neuroscientists would say that consciousness is uh, a byproduct of the brain, and that may be all it is. On the other hand, uh, cultural studies people would say that consciousness is a product of the culture we're brought up in. Now the question, what is it for, though, if we've been given this extraordinary gift of being conscious beings, what do we do with it? What, what is it really for? Well, one classic answer that also probably resonates for each of us is, okay, we're conscious, well, maybe one function of consciousness and purpose is to be as conscious as possible. Maybe one of consciousness's task is to understand itself. And how do we do that? Well, the, the great contemplative and spiritual traditions tell us that our usual state of consciousness is not very clear, is, not, is rather clouded and murky, and that one of the opportunities of human existence is to clarify and refine consciousness so that consciousness wakes up to its true nature, which the contemplative traditions say is transcendental, is consciousness that creates all things. But do we see the meditative traditions offering a means to an end or an end in themselves? Well, the meditative traditions offer a set of practices which cultivate both particular qualities, such as awareness, clarity, consciousness, emotions such as love and compassion, and also a goal of the awakening of consciousness, which is described as a recognition of our true nature, and that is variously known as enlightenment or liberation or salvation or satori, different names, but pointing to the farther reaches of our individual development. And from a very large perspective, there is a an understanding within the contemplative traditions that, yes, there is a larger purpose to human life and to consciousness, and that consciousness is playing this extraordinary cosmic game of creating worlds and in apparently separate individuals who have forgotten what they really are, okay. and yet have the opportunity of waking up to their true nature as pure consciousness. And one of the challenges we all face in the quest for deeper understanding is maintaining the passion of wanting to know, but at the same time, realizing that anything we know is only a very small part of the picture. The claim is that diverse disciplines working together in harmony 
can enhance understanding of human consciousness. I do not always agree. Trained in brain science, I do not naturally weight diverse disciplines equally. I do not like forced harmony. Science is sure. All else is suspect. But being suspect doesn't make all else false. But being suspect does impose a higher or different standard of knowing. As for the wisdom traditions, they'd come low on my list. Which is why, I guess, I should pay more attention to them. I go to the rolling hills above San Francisco to the Institute of Noetic Sciences to meet its president, Marilyn Schlitz. Marilyn trained in anthropology, conducted research in parapsychology, and now leads novel explorations of consciousness. She appreciates science, but sees consciousness as drawn on a far larger canvas. I'll push her on this. Marilyn, to many scientists who believe that only the physical is real, consciousness is derivative. If consciousness has some independent existence, can we ask the question, is there any purpose to it? I would ask the question, does an acorn have purpose? And does a seedling have purpose? And does uh, a child or a baby have purpose? And I think there's no question that there's a telos in that acorn to become an oak tree. And so its purpose in manifesting its consciousness, as it were, is to reach for the light and to begin to offer some you know, greater unfolding for the forest or wherever that tree happens to lie. Anytime we look at life, it unfolds with a sense of purpose toward. So we can ask, what is the purpose of human consciousness? And I would think it's toward growth. It's toward an unfolding of our greater understanding of ourselves and our relationship to the broader world in which we're embedded. Reality is actually articulated through our consciousness, through our ability to sense, to synthesize, and to then put it back out into the world in a way that's directive. Is, is this metaphor, or, or is there some attempt at some real reality underneath all of this? Well, I think that given my metaphysic, which is really that consciousness is the entirety, and you know you can't sort of reduce it, although you can from a, a kind of scientific point of view look at the pieces. The entirety of the world. Of the whole, whatever the whole. that is. So it's the world, it's the universe, it's the universes within the universes, it's the right balance and right relationship that this tiny little planet with this little bit of water was able to then generate the, the vast array of life forms that we have here. To me, that's an example of the goal-directedness of consciousness, to take form, to grow, to expand, to accelerate our appreciation for ourselves. With that metaphysic, then in that context, does human consciousness, in your view, have something really special within that, or is it just part of the, this overall coherent whole? I would say that we are very unique in certain ways, and I think that each one of us is unique. I mean, it is our birthright to individuate, and so we can take on our various perspectives, our various forms, but that ultimately we are part of, you know, Homo sapiens sapiens, which gives us a particular sort of array of qualities, characteristics, capacities, and in fact, if you think about, you know, what is our prowess and potential, uh, we can now create new life forms in a petri dish in the course of an afternoon that had previously taken millions if not billions of years. So we have become very volitional. We have become very agent-oriented in our attempts to sort of harness the physical aspects of reality. No other species has done that. Sure, I'd like consciousness to be cosmic and directive, the heart of reality, giving meaning to existence and purpose to life. Who wouldn't? But wishful thinking can lead to fluffy thoughts. 
Science cannot be asked to confirm that which it should not even address. I need a rigorous materialist, yet someone who sees deeply the profound issues of consciousness. I need the Oxford-trained philosopher known for his radical Mysterian views, Colin McGinn. Colin, as a philosopher who has developed a Mysterian view of consciousness, that uh, consciousness is some, so deeply problematic that we may never understand what it really is all about. How can you look at the potential of purpose or human purpose for consciousness, which many philosophers, particularly philosophers of religion, would like to read in to such a Mysterian position? Yeah, I, th I think consciousness has no more purpose than any other biological adaptation. So they, uh, biological ad adaptations have purpose within the life of the organism. Mm -hmm. Broadly speaking, their purpose is to enable the organism to survive and reproduce. Mm -hmm. Consciousness has that purpose. It's part of our biological endowment. It's what, one of the things which enables us to act in reproductive and survival mode ways. So it has that kind of purpose, but it has no transcendent purpose in the sense that somebody made it that way with a purpose in mind. So it, it seems to me that consciousness is no more special than the kidneys or the heart or the digestive system. It's just one of our adaptations arising, we don't know how, of course, according to the Mysterian position. And it has a purpose within the biological world, but it doesn't have any purpose from the point of view of God designing us to have that. Now, I, I certainly appreciate your feeling that way, but your whole position in philosophy is that consciousness as part of the brain is so different than what the kidney or the yeah. liver or the heart function, even though superficially they're sort of the same. Yeah. And also the fact that you have to have something so unique built into the, the physical world and its expansion to explain it in some maybe some radical ways yeah. that it would seem to push consciousness beyond the normal biological adaptation. Yes. Well, I think it does, but not in the direction of transcendent purpose. It pushes it beyond them in the sense of what can be explained, especially what can be explained within our current theoretical system. So you're right in saying, according to me, consciousness is much more of a mystery than anything else, mm -hmm. even though those things, the other things can be mysterious to lesser degrees. It's a much more profound mystery than those things. But that doesn't lead me to any position which postulates a purpose to the universe or anything of the kind, because my explanation for why consciousness is so baffling to us is a resolutely naturalistic explanation. It, it arises from the fact that our own intelligence has been evolved, has evolved by, as an adaptation, and has the kind of limits that any intelligence of any species on the planet has. So really what's surprising is that we can understand as much as we can about the universe. If we run up against something we can't understand, that's quite predictable, that's what we would, we would suppose. If we found that our intelligence could explain everything about the universe, irrespective of its adaptive advantage to us, that would actually be a count against theory of evolution because that would be an anomaly mm. in, mm. The, in the biological world. So even if consciousness is radically mysterious, Cohen says, it is not supernatural and projects no purpose. Human consciousness, he argues, is an evolutionary adaptation. To most scientists, evolution provides a complete explanation for consciousness. But not everyone agrees. Some see a proto-religious agenda underlying consciousness. I follow the trail to Princeton Theological Seminary to meet an expert who gives a theological interpretation to the anthropological development of human consciousness. Wenzel van Hustein. But consciousness for me as a theologian becomes interesting in terms of the way we are embodied creatures that have certain kind of dispositions. One of those is uh, what I would call our religious disposition. And I think uh, what I find uh, fascinating by going back so far in prehistory is to see that however minimally uh, there has been a religious disposition uh, uh, always. There's a whole discussion out there in, in, in the various sciences about the evolution of morality, the evolution the moral sense, uh, whether uh, it is added to our 
brutal animal instincts by a veneer of culture or whether we inherit that somehow from our uh, uh, most distant primate ancestors or whether we are born with, uh, with an innate sense of, of right and wrong. All of that is theologically interesting and what I did in my work recently is I tied it quite specifically to the famous verse in the Old Testament, uh, uh, you know, where God says, now these humans have become like one of us by knowing good and evil. And that to me is a defining moment for human consciousness and for th not only narrowly thinking about right and wrong, but, uh, but having a kind of a metaphysical awareness that there might be more to life than what we have here and why religions have always been part of our, uh, our human makeup. Well, one can look at the uh, cultural development over tens of thousands of years of, of human history and can see a progression beginning with some very shamanistic, uh, proto-religious activities and then developing. As, as it, doesn't this history mitigate against some uh, real theological uh, uh, truth to it, but rather gives an evolutionary psychology to the development of religious belief, and therefore uh, human consciousness is nothing special. Well, you know, I would, <laughs> I would argue the opposite. I would have found it astounding if in the natural evolution of, of, of human history, and especially human prehistory, suddenly there was this uh, a supernatural personal God present that would kind of organize everything. I mean, surely that, that, that would be deeply unnatural. I think uh, there is a fascinating uh, evolution to religion and religious dispositions too. What I would resist is the, the idea that science has proven once for all, that religion or the religious disposition is the kind of primitive leftover from the past. Why would we discriminate against religious dispositions when our human consciousness is so complex? The argument would be is that human consciousness, because of its self-awareness, produces this desire for religion but that the religion is uh, an, an artifact of consciousness as opposed to the uh, theological idea that religion is uh, the purpose of consciousness. One, it's the artifact. The other, it's the purpose. I, I know, I know those <laughs> arguments well. But I, I also believe that those uh, arguments cannot be made conclusively in terms of, say, uh, evolutionary psychology or neuroscience only. In the end, it's a, de it's a deep commitment that uh, even if, uh, in terms of my own consciousness, uh, I have to deal with the way that this artifact has been created in the history of humankind and also for me, there may be more behind this. I would not be able to tell you, uh, say as a neuroscientist, that, oh, you know, I have news for you, God created this consciousness with a special purpose. But I can say that what I see in the history of, of our species and what neuroscience, cognitive science, paleoanthropology, uh, uh, evolutionary biology is explaining to us by the day in an exciting way, what I see there I find consonant with or convergent with as a theologian uh, I believe that God has this purpose for this species but I could never enforce that or blur that with scientific lines, but certainly the richer notion of, of consciousness that would, from a theological point for me, uh, now gives a certain kind of purpose to, to who we are. I would also feel very sympathetic to. So is human consciousness anything special? I'd best be careful. I fear hope masquerading as belief. Consider five explanations of consciousness. Neurobiology, consciousness comes entirely from brain. And because human brain is more developed than animal brain, human consciousness is more aware than animal consciousness. Evolution, human consciousness developed gradually, accidentally, perhaps facilitating survival of the fittest, perhaps as fortuitous byproduct. Anthropology. Human consciousness emerged progressively, a product of cultural development. Theology. God created human consciousness so that human beings could be self-conscious creatures to have personal relationships with God. Mysticism. Cosmic consciousness is the ground of all being. 
the wellspring from which all that exists flows. And human consciousness is but a speck of cosmic consciousness. Some say that while human consciousness is nothing special, what we make of it can be special, but never transcendent, because consciousness has no great meaning, no grand purpose. I disagree. I say, consciousness is deeply consequential. I have no proof, but that's my bet, getting closer to truth. For complete interviews and for further information, please visit closertotruth.com.